All right, and welcome to uh, my series of talks within this event on the Office file formats. I'm going to be doing uh, three talks on the Office binary file formats, the Word, PowerPoint, and Excel. And then later in the afternoon, if you stick around, I'll also do another talk on the OOXML or Office Open XML file format. <clears throat> For those of you who don't know me, my name is Tom Jebo. I am an Escalation engineer in the Microsoft Open Specifications Developer Support team. And uh, our team does what uh, Michael and some of the others we were talking about earlier, we support the open specifications and people who are implementing against them uh, or need help with clarification and various other issues. Throughout my talks, I'm going to uh, have links, and especially at the end in the resource sections of my talks, have links uh, to various resources, but also to ways that you can communicate with my team. So both Two of those ways that you can communicate with us are through an email alias that uh, I believe Michael and Daryl both mentioned. That's dochelp, D-O-C-H-E-L-P, at microsoft.com. And also the open specifications forums on MSDN. OK, so we're going to start today with um, the talk on the Word binary file format. And let's take a look at what we're going to go over here today. Uh, we'll do an overview of the specification and the format. Through the slides, uh, this uh, demonstration of text extraction is actually a little bit of a misnomer. But through the slides, we'll see how text is extracted. And uh, you'll get a feel for you know, how to do that. Um, and then we're going to talk about properties. Properties are a very important part of the word document format. Then we're also going to talk about locating various objects, things like pictures and shapes and text boxes and OLE objects. And then at the end, we'll have a little bit of a discussion, just a brief, about a slide about pitfalls of, of editing. So what are some of the things that happen when uh, you edit the format directly uh, without using Word or an application that, that is adept at parsing the Word format? So for starters, um, the open specification that describes the word format is MS-Doc. If you search for this on Bing or Google, uh, you'll find a number of hits, um, one of which may be the Mississippi Department of Corrections. That's kind of a joke, but it actually does come up. Um, the important thing to note is that we put brackets around the short names of our open specifications, so it'll make it easy for you to find the actual open specification. And in this case, it's the brackets around MS Doc. <clears throat> and the link is here. We also provide the PDF, as was mentioned earlier, we provide a download for the PDFs so that you can easily um, read and, and edit the specification. So I provided uh, a few links here, or, or a few, not links, but a few references here in the, the open specification, the MS Doc open specification, that I think are good for getting started. Um, 1.3, and these are all references in the, in the actual PDF file. Section 1.3 is a structure overview. And this links to other important sections within the doc. Uh, 131 talks about characters, 135 talks about pictures, and these are important things to review when you're getting started with the document and with the specification. 2.2 is fundamental concepts, and that has more of like a, a descriptive um, discussion about some of the things we're just about to talk about in the next couple of slides. And these are building blocks for what we're going, you know, what we're going to talk about in the details. And then 2.4 talks about the document content, content what's actually in the document uh, itself, and also includes things like algorithms, step-by-step -step processes to extract or to, to find various parts of, of the Word binary file format. 
It also has 2.43, or, or uh, 2.4.3 has an overview of tables. And then section three contains some examples, um, one of which is 3.1, which has a CLX structure, which we're going to also discuss in this presentation. And that's all about text extraction. So we're going to be covering that as we go along. So to, to get started with the word file format, you also have to have a background in something else uh, because it's built on top of the Olay structured storage file format. This is uh, effectively, I'm going to give a little bit, just a very brief overview of what that is. Olay structured storage or the compound file format is a, an architecture that allows an application to uh, organize its data within a single file in a, in a way that it looks like a file system. So it has effectively folders and files within that file. And this is all done through Windows APIs or if you're on a, uh, another platform that happens to have library that can, that can handle uh, Olay structured storage it has the appropriate APIs to do this. And here are some of the APIs I've listed that, that deal with structured storage. So the word uh, format, as well as Excel and PowerPoint, are all built on top of that uh, architecture. One of the most important uh, streams, and, and when I talk about streams, this is analogous to a file in a file system. A storage is analogous to a folder. And in, a, in an Olay structured storage file, a stream is like the file. And one of the most important ones in the Word format is the Word document stream. This is where most of the content for the Word, uh, the Word binary format lives and for the actual document, the text, the paragraph markers, the, uh, the various field markers and things like that. There's something called, in, in the Word document stream, there's something called the FIB, or the file information block. This is at offset zero. This is at the very beginning of the Word document stream. And the FIB points to everything else. So it's, it's basically a big, long structure with a lot of pointers to, to other structures that then allow you to find other parts of the document. We'll see that, too, as we get deeper into this. Before I start into, um, you know, start into the details and describing some of these things, I just want to emphasize that it is really important if you're going to understand the word uh, binary file format that you have some understanding of the CFB, which is uh, the compound file binary format. And that is also an open specification. That's MS CFB that I've listed here. <clears throat> it's very difficult uh, and tedious to try to parse a word binary file format without having the help of APIs on at least some kind of interoperable APIs on, on a platform that understands them. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the uh, concepts in the word file format. One of the most important and, and fundamental logical concepts in the wor word binary format is the CP. This is the character position. This is a logical construct in that it's a, it's a two byte pointer, basically, or two byte uh, value that points to logical position within the word document. And that logical position is anything from text to paragraph markers, to uh, other field markers and things like that. So, so it includes all these things like table cell marks, and I've listed a few of them, object anchors and things like that. So the CP is used throughout the format. It's very, very important to note. Um, it is a structure, but it is not uh, like the other structures in that it, is, it doesn't have multiple uh, members to it. It just simply points to a position within the logical document. And you'll see, uh, hopefully you get a feel as we go along and build on this, what this means. 
a PLC is a mapping of CPs, these are the character positions, to some data about that CP. So if we have uh, something at a CP or logical character position 20, then we can associate some data with it. And depending on the way that that PLC structure is defined, and there are many PLC structures in the word binary file format, um, that data can mean different things. It could be formatting data, it could be a number of different things. Uh, and, and PLCs are actually designed in two different ways. Um, PLCs can map a CP range, so a range of character positions to some data about it, in which case the, there's only, there's actually one less data element in the, in the data side of the PLC. Uh, then there are CPs. Or it can map a CP to data about that single character position only. And you'll see if you, if you get into the specification, we'll see here that there are actually many different kinds of PLCs that are used. So if you're interested in just seeing an example of text extraction, how to find the text in a word binary uh, uh, format or word document, uh, you can see an example in section 3.1. <clears throat> but to kind of give an overview of this, every document has something called a CLX. This is a structure that is pointed to by the FIB. And as you see here, I've, I've uh, actually identified the particular member of the FIB, and the FIB is a very large structure with many other very large structures that are versioned by the different word versions uh, that have come out. But the 97 version you see here, this FIB RGFCLCB97, big long mouthful, is actually um, the largest of them, and it contains the most, it's, it's basically the base structure and then the other ones just add members to it. And what you see here is this FC CLX. This points to this CLX structure that every document contains. Um, I'm not necessarily going to expand in all the acronyms and tell you what they all mean because sometimes it, it, the history of these get lost. Um, so sometimes I will just tell you what these what these acronyms are and, and kind of uh, assume that, you know, if you think long and hard about them or take some time, you can figure out what they are. Uh, but it's more important now that we just kind of overview the steps and what, uh, what is in the, the format. So every CLX has a PCDT structure, and every PCDT structure has a PLC PCD. This is one of the PLCs that I referred to in the previous slide. This is a mapping of uh, character positions to something, some data, okay? So a PLC PCD maps CPs to what? It maps the, uh, CPs to PCDs, which is another structure. And then these PCDs give offsets in the file to where the text is. So remember that the CP is a logical position within the word document. It's a logical position. The FC is an offset to bytes within the word document stream. So the, it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one mapping. And we'll see what this looks like in an example in the next slide. So here's an example of a PLC PCD. Here are the CPs. And in this case, we are mapping ranges of CPs to PCD structures, which describe that range. In the first case, the PCD structure describes 0 through 5, uh, character positions 0 through 5. And the offset is hex C22. The, the PCD structure also contains a bit which tells whether the text, the actual uh, bytes 
text is compressed or not. And all this means is that it, the Unicode uh, has been identified as compressible. The high order byte is always zero, so we can remove the high order byte. <clears throat> and that's an easy way to compress the text. So if it is compressed, um, then the, or if it isn't compressed, then we can use the same offset. If it is compressed, then we have to divide the offset by two. And you'll see in the second entry uh, with the FC of 800 that it's actually an actual FC of 400 because this was a compressed text. So what does this all mean? It just means that we have identified logical character positions in the document and ranges of them and then said where the, actually identified where the text in the Word document stream is for that, for those character positions. And here's an example of what it would look like if we actually dumped out the text at those positions in a sample Word document file. And notice the offsets for the FCC 22, the word hello, and then the other ones have been uh, divided by two because they were compressed text offsets. Okay. So text can actually be in multiple places. It's not just in the, the main document part or in the in the Word document part that we would see normally as uh, just runs of text in, in Word processing. But it can also be, of course, in the headers. It can be in text boxes and, and other places. And because of that, there are actually document parts within the Word document stream. A PLC will still map text the same way in all these different parts. These are all just subdivisions of the Word document stream. And it will still map these um, and it kind of treats them all the same. Um, for everything other than the main document, there's a P PLC which tells you where the boundaries are for that part. For example, the text box, the PLC FTXBXTXT, which is another kind of mouthful of a, of a label, uh, specifies the boundaries between text boxes. So most PLCs work like the uh, PLC PCD, spanning all of the document parts, so basically covering the entire Word document stream. Field PLCs work a little bit differently than that, and we will cover fields later uh, in the presentation. Okay, so Properties um, are a, a very, another very important fundamental concept within the Word uh, binary file format. And I've listed here a few sections that um, give some important information. There's a 1.13 or 1.33 gives an introduction to properties. 2.2.5 uh, actually does describe properties and it gives an overview of how they work. Uh, 2.4.6 actually lists the, uh, the hierarchy, meaning uh, how properties are applied to the different pieces within the document, paragraphs and lists and numbers and things like that. So properties are actually stored as arrays of differences from the default values for properties. Um, so we have in, and th those are encoded in a PRL structure. So we have, at the, at the fundamental level, we have an SPRM. I'll just say uh, a sperm uh, because it's easier to say that. But it's um, basically what that is is a single property modifier. If you think about it that way, it makes it easier to identify. Um, and that identifies the property that you want to change from the default. So, uh, and we'll see an example of this a little bit later, so it may become more clear, hopefully. But it's a very simple structure, and it just has a couple of fields with an ID and a couple of other things. And that identifies the property that you want to change. A PRL um, combines 
an, a sperm with its operand. So the operand then tells it what you want to change that property to. And the list of sperms in the um, in 2.46 and a couple of other sections gives the default values uh, that you that you would assume if there were no property modifiers in the document found. And two, uh, two six actually is the list of, of the properties. <clears throat> so to, uh, to give an example of uh, direct formatting of text, meaning changing some property directly on some text in a Word document, you can see example four in section 3.4. And we'll just give a little, a, a brief overview of that as well. So every document has this big long name, PLC FBTE chip X, okay? And here's the FIB member that points to it, the file information block member that points to it. And a PLC FBTE chip X is something, it's, it's a PLC like we talked about before. It's a little different though. Instead of mapping character positions, it maps FCs. FCs are offsets within the Word document stream. So these are directly into the Word document stream where the text is. And so it's mapping offsets to the this chipx FKP structure. Um, and then a chipx FKP structure maps FCs to sets of properties. So this PLC works a little bit differently. It doesn't, doesn't map CPs, but it maps FCs. And this is the way that Word does direct formatting of text. So if it wants to go directly to some offset in the Word document stream where text is and change, say, the font color or something like that, then, then that's what it would use. Here's a simple example of a PLC FBT chip X. We have an array of FCs and then the data that describes that range, in this case we're talking about a range, the data is a PN. This PN is an integer value that specifies the offset in the Word document stream of a chip X FKP structure. So as I said before, that's what we're pointing to. It just happens that this offset is multiplied by 512 in the Word, to get to the Word document stream offset. So in this case, 512 uh, in decimal would be 200 hex. If we multiply that by three, we'd get 600 hex. And that's where we go to look for the chip X FKP structure, which would have a description of, of the properties of this range of text. And here it is. And the chip X FKP structure has in itself an array of offsets. And for each of those elements, uh, each of those offset elements, it also has uh, an array of offsets to within itself. I know that's a little confusing, but it's self-referential. And within that um, is the uh, uh, is the information that we're looking for that has the uh, the property, the chip X property about that run of text. And here's the chip X. This is an example of a chip X. And in this case, it has uh, nine bytes in, in this particular chip X. And it has two SPRMs. It actually has two PRLs. We don't say that they are PRLs in here, but a PRL is defined as an SPRM followed by the operand that for the modified or for the uh, property that it modifies. So in this case, SPRM CICO 
and SPRM CCV both modify the color of some text. And they're both modifying um, the color to something different. So what happens when we have two SPRMs found in, in an array of PRLs, an array of property modifier um, structures? What word does is it takes the last one. And so the last one wins. In this case, the last one sequentially would be the uh, SBRM CCV, which changed the text to orange. The reason that there are different SBRMs or sperms um, for the same, quote, the same property is because sometimes they use different ways to modify the property. In this case, uh, SPRM CICO use a one byte operand to change the color of the text and SPRM CCV used a four byte operand and the reason that the size is different was because they were using a different format to specify the color. The four byte was a color structure which had a different structure than the one byte uh, format. So you'll see that that happens in the, when you're parsing Word documents and when you're looking at formatting, you'll see that uh, you'll have possibly multiple properties affecting the same attribute, color, formatting, whatever, um, and yet they have different names. Okay, so another thing that, that is interesting to note is how to find shapes within a document. And section 1.3.5 talks about this. Uh, what you need to know about shapes is for a floating shape, the Unicode character that you're going to find in the, in the document stream, in the Word document stream, is a hex 0008. That's what you'll actually find at the location where that shape exists. What you'll find for the formatting for that shape, if you, do, if you look at the direct formatting, what we've just kind of talked about in the last few slides, is a property modifier called SPRM CF spec or special. And if that is applied, then, then we also look for um, that CP, the character position for that text in a structure called PLC F SPA. And this is a PLC that maps data for shapes in the document. It maps these CPs to SPA structures. And SPA structures are shape structures which include links to MSO draw structures. So this is probably the first time I've mentioned ODraw um, in this talk. And MSO draw is another open specification that covers all of the, uh, basically all of the drawing and shapes and bitmap type structures that are used by the office applications. Um, most, uh, uh, almost all the office applications share this information and share these structures and use them when they're drawing within their own documents. There's sort of an interconnectedness between MSO draw and uh, the other MS doc and MS XLS and MS BPT in that they can use uh, Word, Excel, PowerPoint can use the ODraw structures but within the ODraw structures, there are references to fields which are then used by the client, meaning Word, Excel, PowerPoint, to store data. So it's a very nested kind of interconnected way. And the reason for that is because they may want common office routines to draw the shapes for them, but they also may want to store information in those shape structures that allow them to position or do specific things that a Word document needs to do or that an Excel spreadsheet needs to do. For example, anchoring off of a particular cell or floating the shape or making it not floating in line with text and things like that. So just a little bit of an overview on ODraw. 
okay? And that, so that was for inline pictures, finding in, or uh, that was for floating pictures, finding inline pictures, um, the character, it's, it's very similar, but the character is a 0001, so this is what you're, you're gonna see in the text or in the Word document stream. We'll have that same CF spec property uh, modifier applied. Uh, we will also have a CPIC location uh, modifier applied it, using direct formatting. So using the, the method we went through a few slides ago. Uh, but there are no, for these inline pictures, there will be no PLC anchored off the FIB to, to give us a collection of where, or mapping of where all these pictures are. These are all inline within the text. Okay, so now talk a little bit about fields. So finding OLE objects requires that we understand what fields are. Um, so fields are anchored within the, the Word document stream and they have uh, a structure associated with them that allow, you, allow um, Word to uh, basically define a richer, um, a richer format for what is in this field. So you can have a number of different types of fields. In this case, I'm showing an author field. And uh, when we come across this field, it's just simply a character within the text. But when we come across this, we know that at that point in the document is inserted information about the author. It may not necessarily show up uh, when we're looking at the at the word processing document visually, but it's going to, the information is going to be there. It'll be able to be processed and show up somewhere else. Okay, so field characters are referenced by another PLC, which is another mapping, and it's called the PLC FLD. And this is described in 2.8.25. And here we see a, a sort of a graphical layout of what a field looks like. So at that CP, what we will find is, or at that, in that PLC, we will find a mapping of these CPs to these characters, begin, separator, and end characters. And in between those characters will be instruction text, which generally we call that instruction text, sorry, instruction text, and what is this field about? And, and there's a listing of these in the, the specification so you can see exactly what are all the different kinds of fields we can have. One of those would be an OLE object. In this case, this is an author object. And then the result text. Not all fields have a result text. All of them will have an instruction text, but not all will have a result text. Um, which means that also not all of them will have a separator character. Some will just have a beginning and an end character. And the begin character will always be a hex 13, and the end character will be a 15, a hex 15. And then if there's a separator character, it's a hex 14. So here's an example of what the PLC FLD structure looks like, this mapping. So we have the CPs, so just like our our field, our author field that we're looking at here, CP0 is our, uh, associates with our begin character, okay? And there's information about that field. And this, the information in the data section of the PLC FLD identifies that this is an author field. And then we have CP7, which identifies this as a separator character. And then CP21 is identified as an end character. Okay. So finding Olay fields, what we're going to do is we're going to look for uh, a field. So we're going to look for the begin character. And uh, then we're going to look for the flag within the, the 
uh, data section of the PLC FLD, and that is a GRF FLD flag. And we're going to look for one of these one of these enumerations. And for an embedded or linked object, it's going to be either three A or three uh, eight. There's also controls and HTML controls. And then we find the separator character. Um, and then uh, and then we, well, there's actually, so there's a note here about uh, the GRF FLD end um, structure or the end character. If it has a flag set in its, its data that says that it's a zombie embed, uh, this just indicates that this was, it, it was an Olay object, but the field is not able to generate it. So I threw this in so that you would just know to skip over these if you ever see these. And then to find the actual data for the Olay field, <coughs> you would go through the direct formatting that we talked about earlier, check the text, make sure that it's a hex 14, that's the separator. <clears throat> and then look at the modifiers for that particular text in the direct formatting uh, algorithm that we talked about. It should have the CF spec modifier. It should have the CF OLE2 with an operand of one. And then it should have a CF pick location uh, that's non-zero. And this points to the actual data for the Olay uh, object. So that would be application specific, that data that we found at the pick location. Uh, but, but typically, if it's an embedded Olay object, this would be another, probably another compound file within the, this stream, because that's the way Olay works. And so all of these are defined in section 2.6.1. And um, then it, once you get this, the CF pick location, you would convert that to a string. So this is actually the detail of how you would find that, that uh, embedded st storage or embedded data. You convert that data to a string, uh, prepend it with an underscore, and then you'd find the, the storage uh, that had that name in the object pool storage, under the object pool storage within the, the whole Word document, and that's the data. So uh, again, you have to understand how Ole structured storage works and understand that you need to be able to navigate these structures, uh, these storages and streams. And to find the Ole presentation, so what the presentation is, is it's just the picture that represents the object when it's not active. So if you're familiar with Ole linking and embedding, uh, if it's a link, it may just be an icon or it may be some text. If it's an embedding, it's going to be some presentation that, that may be like a snapshot of the last time it was embedded or something like that. Uh, whatever the application decides to, to store as the presentation data. And here's how you'd find it. You go back to the PLC FLD. You'd find the corresponding FLD uh, with the field character of 15. So that would be the end one. And uh, so a note about this, that these uh, PLC FLDs or fields can be nested. So that just means that you need to go to the PLC FLD for the specific field you're looking at. You can't just scan through and look for another end character of hex 15 or something. Um, just a kind of warning so that you don't get caught in that pitfall. And uh, all the text between the separator character and the end character is the uh, result of the field. 
So remember we had instruction text, result text. Um, so that's the result. And that would be the presentation data. So this could be an inline picture. So it could actually be some, you know, as we saw how to find an inline picture, we, you, you end up with an anchor. Uh, that could be an inline picture, um, or it could just be some text for a link. Or it could also be a picture for a link. And then just finding uh, floating OLE objects, it's basically the same as inline ones, but it's going to be in the document part, and I didn't really cover this a lot, but it's the text box document part. I did say that in the FIB we point to the different document parts, and I did show where the uh, FIB points to the text box document part. Okay. So you would use that here, and, and I show it again here, and you'd use that to find uh, the text box uh, document part, and you would find the PLC FLD within there. And then you would look for the ones that are OLE objects, fields that are OLE objects within that text box document part. And this is defined in, uh, the text box document part is defined in 2.3.6. and finding them in other document parts. So any uh, document part can contain text box anchor that can contain text box anchors can contain floating OLE objects. And any document part can contain inline OLE objects. Okay. All right. So that's, that's kind of an overview of sort of the, what you need to kind of get started in, in parsing and looking at a Word uh, binary file, uh, a Word document file. Um, just some pointers, I hope that's helpful to give you some pointers and, and to get familiar a little bit with the, the first structures that you're going to need to parse. Um, this, uh, this slide is really just a uh, sort of, you know, what, what you need to be thinking about your mentality in when modifying a Word document uh, file. So, or, or doing some kind of work with it uh, if you don't necessarily parse the entire Word document or if your, your application doesn't understand the entire specification and you're just trying to, to maybe make some changes. And so it's important to know that everything is kind of interconnected and linked together. Um, so you must update links to everything. So PLCs contain CPs and FKPs contain, you know, offsets and et cetera. So it's just the, the idea is you have to be thinking constantly that there are lots of things you affect when you make a, a change. Um, and and if, you, if you come across a property that your application doesn't understand, say you are writing a word processing application and you want to be able to parse the, the binary file format and you come across a property you don't understand, um, then you should just, you shouldn't preserve it in the, in the content, you should just ignore it and, and skip over it. And if you really want to, to get rid of some part of the document or some, some piece, you should unlink it from the fib. That's the most effective way to get rid of, rid of uh, that piece of the document. And just as a comment, there's really no such thing as light editing. It's, uh, there's not an easy way to do this. And, and this is uh, kind of the nature of the, the binary file formats in general. So um, saving uh, an application that would save the file, um, the idea here is just a, as, a, as an approach, a design approach, read the file into your own inter internal representation and then edit it in that, that representation and then write the new file you know, from your internal representation. 
don't and don't preserve again don't preserve unknown content especially uh, property modifiers <clears throat> and that's it for the the word binary talk um, I think what I'll do is I, we can do some Q&A if it's specifically about this presentation um, about the content I've just covered. If you have detailed questions about, say, a project you're working on or something you want to get more, uh, more detail, please come see me. I'll be here for the rest of the day. I'll also be here uh, for the next two days. Yeah, yeah, maybe you can share some other countries, uh, other business markets uh, experience about how we can use what, what, it, what, what you have said about what the property. Oh, okay. Yeah, so yeah, that we can follow you. You yeah, understand okay. what I mean? You're asking how can you yeah. use the, the word binary file format? Yeah, yeah, may, maybe all the, about the office. The, I, I just see the agenda you you maybe go through the PowerPoint and the exams. We, we, we may we, we might think what about the all these section you can make some example. Okay. That we better. Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay. That's good feedback, yeah. Yeah, I uh, maybe I'll try to do that in, in the, the future. Excuse me, I have a question. Uh, I have, uh, you have mentioned the OLA uh, in binary format and the why it isn't been standardized in OXML. What's the difficulties uh, to be standardized, please? Are, are you asking why OLA has not been standardized? No. That's the question? Uh, OLA actually is specified in, in the open specifications. So uh, yes, it is an open specification, but it's not included in the OXML format. Oh, um, yeah, I don't, I don't have an answer for that. You know why it's not included? Um, I'll have to look into that and get back to you. I do talk about the OXML later today, and maybe maybe I can look, you know, look into that and get get an answer to you.